Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canelli, and welcome to Before the Lights Podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark. Joining us today is a singer, musician, recording artist, trumpeteer, songwriter, and a lover of all music. He's a performer and an entertainer. The youngest and only son of the late musician and entertainer, Louis Prima. Please welcome to the show, Louis Prima Jr. Louis, welcome to Before the Lights. Oh, good morning, afternoon, evening. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. You grew up in Las Vegas on your father's golf course called Fairway to the Stars that he designed. Yep. And the home had a recording studio. You end up moving to New Orleans in the early 70s. The country club eventually closed in 1979, and you and ended up back in Las Vegas. Two things in regards to this home. A, did he teach you golf? And B, what was the golf course like? Uh, I've been playing golf for as long as I, I think I've been speaking English. Um, so, yes, I, I played golf with him every day that he had spare where I wasn't in school, uh, both in Vegas and New Orleans. Now, we, we actually... Uh, lived in New Orleans several times um, when I was younger and uh, New Orleans and Covington, Louisiana, which is where Pretty Acres, the golf course was. And um, that actually, my mother closed that down in the, ooh, well into the nineties. She operated it after my father passed away and I played there up until the end. Um, the the golf course in New or in New Orleans was built for my grandmother. My dad built it mm. for his mom to have a place with a restaurant. It had a little motel unit back in the, I believe it was open in the fifties. And uh, everybody loved that course, man. It was, my father liked tough courses. He didn't like anything easy. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a walk in the park. They had a, the, the one in Covington had a hole called the, the they called it the monster it was on the back nine and it was uh, a 650 yard pi par five. Woo! Uh, yeah, yeah. About 20 yards wide, straight as an arrow. You could not keep it in the fairway. It was the worst hole in the history of mankind. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and I mean, people to this day, when, when you run into somebody new and somebody that, you know, has played on the course, that's the first thing out of their mouth is that old, um, but that was, you know, it was gorgeous. I was set in the woods, you know, and, and just a gorgeous course. The one in Vegas, of course, my father, you know, built this in the middle of a desert and, you know, had to bring in every tree. So I remember it as a small kid, you know, and the, and the trees were barely as tall as me in some aspects, uh, but he built that course. So he had some place to play because he didn't like going to the couple public, a few public courses they had in Vegas. And he, he wanted it to be someplace reasonable that everybody could come play. And, you know, his celebrity friends could come and play. And, um, they, they all came and played the course and it, it was, it was, it was tough. It was in the middle of the desert. He built some Hills in it and, and had a lot of water and it, it was, it was a fun course. I mean, that's, uh, you know, there's, there's, if you're a golfer, there's courses that are just fun to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, because they challenge you, but they're not so difficult that you're throwing clubs all the time. Right. Um, and, and that that's kind of what he had in both aspects. We're going to end up moving into your journey through music. The first, one of the things I want to get out there and ask you is your father was known as the king of swing and did five shows a night. He basically changed the way lounge acts were looked at upon in Las Vegas. In yes. your opinion, Louie, do you think there should be a street named after him here in Las Vegas? You know, there absolutely should. There there were several efforts to make that happen. Um, there's some difficulties in it, the last of which uh, um, Elaine Goodman and I, who who she actually worked for my father. She's known me since I was knee high to a pup, probably babysat me a couple times. Um, but the it, we, we were kind of close to moving forward in it, and it just comes down to a cost aspect because no matter where you put it the petitioner shoulders the burden of changing the address for every business house resident mm. business card envelope stationery the the you know maps map quest every you you shoulder that burden to make that cost happen and uh 
it just it was it's a costly venture so we're hoping one day they just uh build one from scratch and do it at least in a nice area or the city takes on the responsibility themselves which unfortunately i don't see happening i hope it does it's way past do overdue too. it needs to be done i mean you, Absolutely. you go back into the 60s you talk about music and people i've i've interviewed and your father's name comes up all the time look his his name comes up i don't care where you are and you know absolutely in new orleans absolutely in new york absolutely in las vegas there should be something because he put music on the map in three different cities and you know, as far as Las Vegas, you know, the, the, the lounge act, which became in the fifties and sixties, sixties, the place to go, that was the nightlife. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, he was five shows a night. He would go on, he'd start playing as the headliner was ending and it was a party until dawn. And this was born out of a room in the corner of the casino where the gamblers wives would go sit and eat shrimp cocktails and hear somebody play the banjo. And my father turned it into just, you know, a Mecca of entertainment. Yes. His name should be there. And no, I don't think we should have to pay for things like that by ourselves as the family. You know, I agree. Your mother is Gia Malone who performed with your father starting in 1962 she taught you to play the drums at age five. Why the drums? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so my my mother, Jim, my own, uh, grew up in uh, Tom's River, New Jersey. She was uh, born in Roebling, moved a couple little places. And my grandfather owned a bar on Seaside Heights, which is the boardwalk. They even did uh, a couple spring breaks there on MTV. Um, and he owned a restaurant and it, his... Uh, my godfather, my dad's bass player in the 60s, Roly DiOrio, uh, was friends with my mom's uncle. And that's how my mom got the audition. But my mother was a, you know, she grew up sitting on the beach watching Frankie Valley play guitar over bonfires before he hit it big. That's how she grew up. She was a rock and roller and she loved rock music and was an, uh, I mean, an uh, amazing piano player and accomplished musician. And I don't know that how the drums ended up in the house. There's a couple photos floating around on social media. Uh, it's a tiny little set. It was blue. I'm, I think I'm one of the pictures I'm playing barefoot, but my father, my mother knew how to play the drums and she sat me down and this is how you play a basic beat. And you go from there. You were also taught piano from your aunt and you learned the guitar in seventh grade. And then at age 12, you had an attraction to the trumpet, which was the year that your father passed after he was in a coma for three years. Louis, what was the attraction to the trumpet after drums and piano and guitar? A little bit of frustration, a little bit of happenstance. So, you know, the piano was very young with my aunt. She was a nun uh, down here in New Orleans, and I, I took piano and played in recitals and um, actually I, I, I might not have been the seventh grade. It might've been the end of sixth grade, whenever I decided I wanted to play the guitar. Uh, but I had broken my left arm, uh, clean through, you know, it, it bent completely at me and I lost kind of independent motion in the last three fingers in the middle of the ring finger and the pinky finger where like it's, it's, a, it's still difficult now, but back when you're young and you can't, you can't make your pinky do what it's supposed to do on a piano or a guitar. I just got frustrated. It, it was, it was, I, you know, I wanted to be a guitar player. I'm never going to be a guitar player, whatever you do as a little child. Um, but it was right. You know, right after my dad passed, he passed in uh, August of, I'm sorry, September of August. I get it confused. Um, of 78. And we moved to Vegas in December of 78 and uh when you're going to you know junior high school in vegas you get to pick your electives and and things like that which in louisiana it's a little different uh but i was like well let me uh, there's all these trumpets laying around let me let me pick up the trumpet i wanted to i knew i wanted to play music i love music i enjoyed music um let me try to play the trumpet and you know my my dad had sat me down and i could make a noise through it but by no means did i know where a c was or what to do with my fingers um and i i that's when i picked it up it was it's a it's a love of music and 
uh, two handed instruments, just, I, I frustrate easily. You know, I, I'm, I'm one of them people that I, I want to do something really good when I'm doing it. And if it's difficult, I'm going to frustrate and get away from it. And I moved on to the trumpet and played it all through school. Did you have any interaction on your own or through your dad with Sam Butera? And if so, what was that experience like? You know, the, Sam, uh, the entire band was around. I mean, that was my family growing up. Um, we we traveled with my dad during the summers. Every summer, we would meet my father wherever he was, somewhere in the middle of it. We'd go spend two weeks with my grandparents on my mom's side in New Jersey. And then we'd join my dad back on the road and ride around in a motorhome. Um, every holiday, the entire band was over. Every birthday, uh, that was family. You know, Sam is my sister's uh, godfather. And you know, and and never to, never to say a bad word about his playing because he was one of the most brilliant musicians on this planet. Mm -hmm. Um, arguably without a doubt, the best sax player there ever was or will be. Um, but not a very nice man, unfortunately. And there were bad words when my father, uh, first went into surgery and fell into the coma and he, we lost touch with him. From that point on, it became very ugly with legal battles over names and rights and, you know, to saying vicious things in, in the press, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, uh, I had where I ended up in a hallway with him at uh, the Suncoast <laughs> and uh, spoke a little bit of my piece and, and walked away. And uh, I know he had made amends with my mother at some point and they became at least cordial again. Uh, Vera, his wife, is an amazing person. Every time I play uh, this one venue in Staten Island, um, really good friend of Vera, Sam's widow, uh, shows up and we get on the phone and talk together. Um, I only met his, I mean, I probably knew him as a kid. I don't have a, a lot of conscious memory, but I met his kids for the first time at his funeral. So um, it's one of those entertainment uh, family stories you hear too often. And unfortunately the playing didn't match the man. That's too bad to hear. You were actually present for their last recording of your father's. What do you recall about that? <laughs> Almost all of it. Do you really? Um, yeah. And, and I've always tried to remember, I mean, I, I ended up in the, uh, in my rock band, I ended up in the studio where he recorded it. And I, I had it viewed at a, a complete different part of town in Vegas. It was called Las Vegas recording studio it was off a um, Boulder highway, like in the Charleston area uh, toward the mountain uh, two story building. Um, and I remember being in the, the control booth was on up high looking uh, overlooked the, uh, the studio. And I remember that, I remember that my my dad had bought in a lot of outside musicians to record that album. And there was a, a guy, they called him equipment. He pulled up in a, in a box truck and he played every instrument. Um, and he came in and did a lot of the horns on the song. I'm leaving you. That's on that album, which is the last song he recorded and finished and his only true ballad. And you li I can't listen to the song. It chokes me up. Um, but it was neat watching the process. He was involved in every step of it. And, uh, like the song Bacha Galoop, I, it was a, you know, four minute and 50 second song that he sat and trimmed and cut down to three minutes and you to watch the process and, and see people just come in and work on that level. Um, I think has stuck with me through my career as far as striving for that, um, that kind of perfection and that kind of knowledge that goes into recording. Your father's song royalties at one time were owned by somebody wreck. else, but do you have them back in your family now? Train wreck is what it was. <laughs> yeah. My father passed away, didn't own a thing. Um, and that's, that's just kind of summing it up. Uh, it's not, not just one person. His, his, the masters are scattered 
to the four corners of the world. The, uh, the rights are with everybody. Half the stuff's gone. Um, half of the things expire because he, uh, he wasn't included in the, he's, it, uh, most of his songs aren't grandfathered in with the, um, Sonny Bono laws when all the copyright laws started to mm. change. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother worked tirelessly from 78 until her passing, um, regaining rights, protecting the rights. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to protect it so that nobody else can come in and take it. Even if you're not going to own it, the copyright laws, you, if, if you, if you inherited a song from somebody via death, you may not will it to a second party, um, so once she passed, it all had to be protected unless it was part of the grandfathered clauses. Trust me, the music business is the biggest nightmare business end in the world. I don't know how my mother navigated it and managed to recoup and work deals and regain, if nothing else, partial rights to some of his more famous hits. I don't know how she did it. Um, it's, uh, most of it's not owned by the estate anymore, um, but it's protected. There's money still being made. There's uh, a lot of work that's done within the GMI own estate, the Gia Prima estate. And, um, you know, he, my father was one of them old school musicians that uh, uh, didn't really care much about the business and they just wanted to make music. And he, I, I don't want to say he let people walk on him. He just didn't care. Louis, who are some of your mentors? <laughs> I don't know if I, so and if, if I had to come up with an actual mentor, I would 100% uh, my high school band director, uh, William McMosley, we called him Mac. Uh, he, uh, God rest his soul. He just passed away two years ago. One of the, one of the greatest human beings I think I've ever met. He treated us all uh, not as an equal, but he treated us as, adults, young adults that needed to be fostered, that needed to know right from wrong, that needed to know every little thing about music as well as life. And he, I mean, you, we, you know, you can talk to any one of his students throughout his career. They're going to say the same thing. He was just a brilliant, kind, strict. Uh, he, he was that missing figure in a lot of people's lives as they grow up that don't have a direction Mm -hmm. that gives them, I mean, uh, you know, Cleto Escobedo, Jimmy Kimmel's, uh, musical director, Cleto, I went to school with Cleto and I went to school with Jimmy Kimmel and we were all under Mac and he, you know, I know they would both give him a little bit of credit for where they are in their careers as well. Um, you know, I, I, other than him, I don't know. I, I've, you know, I, I had my father, I had my mother, but I essentially raised myself and, you know, that's a, that's a tough thing for any family to go through, you know, somebody as large as my father was slipping into a coma for three years where he's just laying there Mm -hmm. and the burden that puts on the wife, the family, let alone when you're nine years old and that happens. Uh, I, I was on my own, you know, mm-hmm. no, 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 no hatred or anger towards anybody, but that's just the way it was. And I'm kind of glad I ended up with Mick Mosley as a, as a teacher, because he, he, he knew how to set you straight and he was not afraid to smack you. You were part of the band problem child, which opened for numerous <laughs> acts. This was more of a, was it a hard rock or heavy rock kind of band, Louie? Uh, it was an early ACDC, uh, with some offbeat jazz elements kind of thing. It wasn't, wasn't like hard rock. We, you you couldn't put us in the same categories, Metallica. I don't know. A lot of people said we kind of had our own thing. Um, very accessible. Uh, people still come up to me today and sing the songs and, uh, we just couldn't get that elusive record deal. Um, but it was, uh, Shoot, that band was together nine, ten years. We we set attendance records in in the the Hollywood music scene as a as a band, nobody band from out of state, and 
every place we went, we filled venues and, and I had that, that was uh, a time of my life. I wouldn't trade for anything. Um, you know, you, you went into it 100% and you starved and you worked hard and you, you went out and sucked and you, <laughs> you know, you, you did everything you had to do to grow as a musician or as an artist, uh, to be where we wanted to be. And it was 100% original music. I've never been a cover band guy. Uh, and we, we, it's a lot of memories, a lot of great friends I still have from that era. And, you know, if I could go back and make the decision to do it again, I 100% would do it again. What was the moment or the decision in your life when you decided to focus on your father's style of music? Uh, I, I always loved my father's music. You know, there, there's never been any, and any effort to shy away from it or be, Oh, I hate my parents or anything like that. Um, when I gave up, I gave up rock music for a lot of reasons. Uh, the, the business end of it was one number two, the, the popular music rock and roll was going in a weird direction. Grunge was coming out. Grunge is angry and sad and depressing. And I'm not an angry, sad, depressed guy. Maybe I am, but I don't want to be. So I don't want to make that kind of music. Um, and I, I just kind of got away from it uh, and immediately tried to put a band together doing my dad's music. I, I decided I, I wanted to stay in music, I thought. Uh, and I, I wanted to stay home in Vegas. And I figured, let me just get into some lounges and I'll, I'll work here doing this for a while and see what happens. And I, and I kind of, I kind of knew that swing was going to make a comeback. I, I had friends of mine. I was friends with the band Royal crown review, uh, back from their, I think it was the second time they played Vegas in shoot uh, late, a late eighties, 89, 90. I can't remember the date. They, they played at Arizona Charlie's in the little lounge that they used to have over there. On Decatur? And, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. And a couple of friends of mine took me over there and I watched this band and I went, wow, that's cool. And I got to, got to know them uh, over a few months. And, and I, I knew people in the Brian Setzer camp and I knew that he was looking at trying to move and do a big band album and type of thing. And, and so I was like, maybe, maybe if I can get something going, maybe I can, maybe this will become a movement and I can capitalize on it. And, uh, it became a movement. I couldn't capitalize on it. And I, maybe it was a lack of actual want, um, to do the time. Like I did the time in a rock band. I, I kind of just wanted to make music and, uh, Las Vegas was not ready to put bands back in lounges yet. And it just kind of wrong bad timing, uh, wrong time. So I, I, and I had a, uh, you know, my youngest son was barely one years old at the time. And I went, uh, I'm done. I'm getting out. And I got out, mm -hmm. um, in the back of my mind, I always went, I'm going to get back in, but let me raise my kids and do the right thing. Um, I, as, as a child, I moved, I went to 14 different school districts. Uh, that's not a happy place for a child child. I think, um, I agree. <laughs> and I, I, I kind of wanted, you know, my goal with, you know, I couldn't make it happen for my oldest son, but the youngest son was like, okay, the house you're kind of born in, you're going to graduate high school in, and we're going to figure it out later. And as we, you know, we moved down the road and I got day jobs and I'm working and making money and doing the right thing. I'm just going and sitting in with friends, bands and doing this. And then I kind of put a ACDC tribute band together and was singing little Bon Scott tunes on every, you know, every fifth weekend or whatever it was. And it was just a, a chance running into of my sister and Mike Varney who owns Shrapnel Records. Uh, that kind of kickstarted me getting back into music because he was doing some event with this club he belongs to. Um, and they were kind of doing a Louis Prima show and he asked me to come out and, and, and sit in and be a part of it. And then he was like, did you want to sing? And I said, absolutely. And when I saw the crowd's reaction, I went, you know, 
I can still do this and I can use this as the vehicle to take over where I was in the rock band and where I was in the rock band was I want to create music. I just don't want to make music. I want to create, I want to, I want, I want the elusive record deal. I want a record label to believe in me to make, let me create music and produce it. And they're going to put it out and they're going to put it in record stores and, and I'm going to go on tour and all the grand things you want as a, young kid getting into music i figured people still people still love this music as much as i do let me use it to get me where i was and it got me where i was thankfully uh through a lot of hard work a great band and and a brilliant record label and and uh here i am Louis Prima Jr. and the Witnesses, which was your father's band, they are a horn-driven, 10-piece, New Orleans-style band known for their energy. Louis, what did you learn or what did your father maybe teach you indirectly that you didn't realize you had about show business? Humility. Um, one of the things I saw my father, you know, when when my father was home in Vegas or, or in New Orleans, um, when we lived here, he took a great deal of pride in dragging me along everywhere he went, no matter how small I was. And what I got to see was somebody that was never too busy to talk to anybody that came up to him. Didn't matter who it was. He was never, he could be running late to, to meet the Pope and he would stop and have a conversation with whoever came up to him. And he treated everybody that I saw him treat. He t- treated everybody with equal levels of respect and love. And it just kind of, that's always stuck with me. I promise you, I have not always been that person, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it allows me in the record business and in the entertainment business um, to remain accessible enough to where, you know, especially in the genre and in the level of music that we're doing right now, um, that it, it allows us to be accessible and feel as accessible as the shows are. I want our live shows to feel like I'm playing in your backyard. And if I'm playing in your backyard, I must know you. So I must treat you like I know you and you're my friend. And it's, uh, that's just kind of always been important to me in all aspects of the music business uh, that I've been in to just be humble about what you do. You know, there, there's always going to be somebody better than me, um, but I will outwork you, (laughs) but I, I still want to be, you know, humble and accessible. And I think that's, you know, the key thing he taught me. And the second thing is, you know, I am Gemini. The second thing he taught me, and it was one of his sayings, a hundred times I heard him say it. Familiarity breeds contempt. Mm, good line. Really yep. good line. Let him in. Don't let him rule you. That's- <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, go to the show notes. I'm going to put links to all the music of Louis Prima Jr. And it is fantastic stuff. I have been listening to it pretty much on repeat for the last couple of uh, weeks here. 2012, the LP Return of the Wildest, Louis and the Witnesses. I want to touch base on the national TV debut on Access Hollywood Live that when you got done, everybody's dancing, including the host of the show. You know, it. we did that show twice. Uh, we, we came back for their Christmas show that year. And unfortunately, there was a, a, a national tragedy event that happened and we got uh, what's it called preempted. So not a lot of people saw the show. Uh, but that Christmas show, Henry Winkler was on. And Henry Winkler was dancing at the end of the show. Look, we, it, it, it came through my management company, UD factory and, and, uh, uh, Seth Udoff and, and his partner at the time, Mike Lakata had a friend that was working with access Hollywood and they were looking to get music on the show and try to see what direction it was going. So I raised my hand and said, pick me. And, uh, we went in there and, you know, did, did, uh, a couple songs and did uh, commercial bumps and, and had a blast. And I think people dug it. Um, and, uh, 
the uh, I, I run into Kit Hoover once since doing the show, and she, you know, she still remembers that was that was the best dancing around. They were dancing, they watching, and and I I want to say uh, I'm terrible now. Uh, who was Hannah Montana? Was that Miley Cyrus? I can't remember. Yeah, it was. That was, was it Miley, Miley Cyrus. Cyrus was on the show. I think she was on that yeah. show as well, dancing with Henry Winkler. So. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. 2014 LP Blow, <laughs> Capitol Records in the same studio where your parents recorded the title track, Blow, Go, Let's Go in New Orleans. The first three tracks of that album, you could put on repeat until you just get tired because you're going to get tired sooner or later because those are high energy tracks. The LP is excellent. I love the LP. It's It was a good time. We, it was It was our... Look, Return of the Wildest was, let me get the Prima songs out of the way. These are my favorite. These are crowd favorites. Let me get them out of the way so I can move forward. Um, Blow was step two. So when I went to the record label, when when we met Warrior Records, the the label's Warrior Records, president is Jim Urban. And uh, when I first talked to Jim, uh, we had done Return of the Wildest ourselves, but they put it out, et cetera. Uh, when we were talking, I was like, are, are you willing to let me create music? He said, absolutely. Let, let us, let us get through this and let's sit and talk what direction you want to go. So it was a, a collaborative effort with the label and the other three saw key songwriters in the band where we sat down and, and we delved into our, you know, we're, we're four different people. And with four different likes and music. So we had bought this mishmash to the table of ideas that I think, I think uh, displays our own style while paying homage to my father's style of music. It stays in that vein. It's, it's Louisiana hard drive and shuffle, but I think we up the ante 10 times and, and bring a modern energy to it and our own, feelings and likes and dislikes and you know you 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 mentioned those three songs but besides the song someday those are my three favorites on the album i can listen to them over and over again still to this day the production's great jim urban is a genius in the studio uh david dominguez the engineer is a genius in the studio and it's just a lot of like-minded or like directioned people working together to come up with it and i i when I listen to it, I go, wow, that's exactly what I wanted it to sound like. And it's, it's, that made me happy. Another fun, energetic song you did in 2021. I know Christmas just passed, but Hey, Skinny <laughs> Santa, fun song. Where did this idea and how, who wrote this, this track? Okay. The, 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 the original artist is JD McPherson. Um, a phenomenal musician and artist, but we were, when we were, uh, this was a, this album was a long time coming. There was some unfortunate personnel changes in the band. Uh, time had gone by and we were finally going to get in and get it done and rewrote most of the songs that we had written for the album. And um, as we were moving into it, it's going to be almost all originals. There's a couple surprises on the album that's going to be coming out. Hopefully, hopefully in a couple months. Um, but as we were sitting down, uh, Jim and I were talking about doing a Christmas EP after this. It was like, okay, we'll do this. And I want to do a Christmas EP. People ask us for it all the time. Um, Let's do something there. So when we got into pre-production, he walks in with this recording and puts it in and goes, listen to this. And here's the, uh, here's the music. Everybody read the music. Would you guys want to do this? We listened to it. And I don't, I don't think it was the original version. Somebody, uh, Jim had had somebody recorded or he did it um himself and and you know the basic recording and we listened to it and i said yeah we could tear that up because look let's put it as a bonus track on the album and we'll we'll get it out during christmas and try to get some traction on the new album because this this was originally supposed to be released in 2020 and uh we walked out of the studio and the world shut down (laughs) and uh, and (laughs) so you're sitting on the I, i i literally finished the vocal tracks and, and I drove my motorcycle from Las Vegas to Hollywood. There was, I was the only person on the road in the middle of the day. It was the most surreal thing. That's gotta be weird. And, well, and nobody knew it was going to last this long. So you're going, all right, well, we can't 
but you know, but let's, let's wait a couple weeks to see what's going to happen. And then we'll produce the album. Okay. Let's wait a couple more weeks. Oh, okay. Now they're going to shut down to July. So let's wait now. Oh, wait, we're going into Christmas. So it just, we, and you can't do anything. You can't, you can't release an album when you can't support it with a tour. Um, the, the record industry is backwards right now, you know, unless you're Miley Cyrus or Beyonce, you sell albums so you can tour. That's not the way it used to be. You toured to support the album. Say. Mm-hmm. So it, it, there's all these guidelines that have to be in place. So we couldn't put the album out. Everybody's been waiting for the album and we're coming up on year two of the pandemic. And Jim gave me a call in, in October and said, Hey, let's, uh, let's put this, I got them to, okay, let's put this out as a single. Now we'll still include it as a bonus track. They'll get it on the album. Let's put it out as a digital single. Let's try to get some people to listen to it during Christmas. It'll be the Christmas present to the world. And dude, it's a fun song. It is fun. (laughs) It is fun. (laughs) Well, and we put together, we, we just got off the road. uh, You know, we've never really toured in December and we just got off the road. I've always kind of wanted to put a Christmas tour together. So we did, we did a, bunch of this old test dates where we just threw a bunch of Christmas songs that I like in the set, including that one. And man, it's, just, it's a fun song to perform too. And it goes over really good live. And um, it's just a great idea. It's, it's like I said, Jim's got a great mind. He knows what's going to fit us and here, take this, see what you can do with it. And that's what we did with it. And I, I dig it. I, I, it's a cool song. I heard it in a Marshalls the other day and I went, Hey, wait, that's me. (laughs) (laughs) You mentioned there's new music coming out in 2022. When this podcast gets released, you'll be back on tour. You'll be heading to Florida, Louisiana, New Jersey. And I want you to touch on some of those dates. And then you'll be in Vegas on May 20th and 21st at the Smith center. And what are some of, what are some of the highlights coming up for you on the tour? So we're going to, we always try to change things up. We, um, Number one, we, you know, there, there's a wealth of music to touch on in my father's and everybody wants to, there, there's songs that I have to do in my father's or they would boo me off stage. Um, everybody wants to hear, I want to be like you, everybody, you got to play gigolo or they're, they're going to throw bottles on stage. <laughs> and, and fortunately we do have a ruckus crowd that would do that. Um, but it's, so, so it switched some things up. We're going to be playing a lot of songs off of our new album. Uh, we're hoping to get the album out this year, uh, 2022. Um, hopefully before, before it's spring, we're, we're working hard and, and wheeling and dealing right now, but we've got, look, when, when the world shut down, we had 120 dates on the books for 2020. Um, we're trying to get that many back this year and it's looking brilliant. Uh, we're, uh, as, at, at this airing, we would have come off a 16 day run um leading into february we're in february we're in panama city beach florida um we're uh in the villages florida we're we're coming to play some gigs in new orleans at the end of february in march we're going to be in back east again um working off a date at the grunin center in tom's river new jersey Uh, it's a special special event to honor my mother uh then we're going back to florida We're, we're hitting the Seattle area. We're going to be coming back to California. Of course, you said Las Vegas, the Smith center. And what we're trying to do is just, it. I, when we come around to a place, I want the show to be completely new. You know, we do, we do a lot of surprises in the show. We take a lot of popular songs and shove them into my style. And, and we let other people sing. I get on the drums. It's, it's kind of mayhem. If you've seen the show, you know what I'm talking about, but you can't do the same songs every time you come around. And we, we, so we're revamping the show and, uh, we just revamped the show as of this airing, uh, just to add some new songs in shuffle, some of the Prima songs around, make sure we're getting to people's favorites and just looking forward to be back on the road. It's Lewis Prima com is the website. You can scroll down to the calendar and see where we're, that's not every place we've got on the books. Those are all contracted and tickets are for sale only. Uh, but click the little track button and we will notify you when tickets become available in the area that you state that you're living in. Uh, and come on out and join the party, man. Uh, the show is a big party. I'm going to put another link in the show notes to the tour. So you listeners can click on that as well. Louis, what were the expectations and pressure on you 
of being your father's son and then playing his iconic songs? You know, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, well, he's not his father. <laughs> uh, it Look, it's a... It's difficult for anybody that is a, a, a offspring of somebody that's huge. Not everybody gets the lucky breaks or whatever, uh, uh, as a Natalie Cole, for example. Um, especially when you're named after him and there's a junior at the end of your name there, especially when it's Louis Prima though, that you cannot get bigger shoes to fill in the entertainment business. Um, I don't think anybody will be the musician he was because I have played with some of the greats musically that come in and look at this book and look at these charts and try to play these progressions that my father created and they don't know what's going on. Um, that it's, it's musically difficult and challenging as a person for everybody in this band to play this music. I think that's why we all enjoy it so much. Um, so that, that that's huge, huge, huge shoes to fill. And I don't want to fill them. Um, you know, I, uh, but I'm not the guy that's shying away from it. It's there's huge expectations when I got on stage. And I think for the most part, the majority of people that see us, um, get the difference, understand the difference immediate appreciate the difference and appreciate what we are doing as equal to their love of my father's music. And this goes for people that are finding us new and have never heard my father and they're going out and buying my father's stuff because we're on the road. We've got the most, you know, when you, when you talk to an artist, they, they, you, you know, in the booking and things, there's a demographic, everybody's got their demographic. My demographic starts at 22 and ends at a hundred and it's flat lines across the top. So that I don't have an age group. I don't have an ethnicity. This music is the most accessible and fun music. Thanks to my father, there is in the world and people come out and enjoy themselves. Um, I don't hold a lot of weight in expectations. I know that I'm not what people think I'm supposed to be. I know my band is not what they think it's supposed to be until they see it. Until they see it, especially those that have seen my father, they remember, wow, that's what Louis Primo was doing. He was entertaining. He was jumping around. It was not just music. It was a show. Um, and everybody's involved. And once that once they see it, I think the expectations on me kind of fall out the window because everything this band does stands on its own. How important is it to you then to create your own legacy? That's what I think that's what everybody sets out to do. Um, I think some people just give up on it. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name famous juniors who have given up on it. That would be wrong of me. Um, I, I just, I, I literally think people start out that way and give up on it. I, I didn't, I didn't pick my father's music back up again to do my father's music. I didn't pick it up again to do a tribute to my father, I think since I got into music and the reason I got into music after school to begin with was to create and create and entertain. It, it really has nothing to do with leaving anything behind. I like, um, it's hard to explain. I, I, it's, it's a desire. My love is being on stage when the lights come on. Okay. Uh, the days I'm not on stage, I sit, I sit in this little house and have me a little whiskey and watch a little TV and <laughs> play, play with my cats. You know, <laughs> I, <laughs> my life is on that stage when the lights come on. I love entertaining. I love taking somebody. I love to look in, through the crowd and find that guy that's not having a good day and make him have a good day. That's what I want to leave behind is just the memory of a good show. Um, and part of that is creating, I, I've got a, I, I think the best thing about this band is I spent my, I spent half my rock career writing songs. I would never sing. Um, I have the ability in this band to write songs that I not necessarily would do because I've got a Kate that can sing it, or I've got 
Marco that can play it, or I've got someone so that can do it. So it, it leaves it wide open to do what I want to do. And that's entertain and create. And, and I just, you know, I just want to leave what I want to leave behind. I want to leave people smiling. That's what I want to leave. Let me uh, end the show with this. Then after everything you just said, how exhausted are you after one of your shows, after all the energy <laughs> that you're putting out? <laughs> Look, we just, <laughs> we just did in December. We did, uh, we, we started with two 12 hour rehearsals back to back. And then we went, and so that that was day one and day two. Then day three through 13 was 11 straight shows in 10 different cities. And I want to tell you something. When the, the last four or five nights you get in that tour bus and the door shuts and the engine starts to roll, there ain't a person awake in the bus but the driver. But I want to tell you, on the, on the last night of the show, nothing was phoned in every single one of us on stage got off that stage a sweaty exhausted mess and it never ever feels any less than brilliant it's uh yeah you're exhausted you you gotta stay you know i i i go to the gym every day not to look good i go to the gym every day so i can get on stage and i like to eat food um and you, 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 you train for it. You get on stage and it's, it's important to me to put that show on every night because it's a missing element in music today. Um, there, there's no great, not a lot of great bands out there anymore that know how to entertain. That's why dancers and light shows are in every show because the musicians I think stand there, um, get up there and entertain and work for it. It's a, and as long as we're doing that, I don't care how exhausted I am at the end of a show, how tired I am at the end of the show. It's the best feeling in the world to have entertained and to work your tail off. And it's at that point, it becomes not work. It becomes absolute fun and it's absolute fun. That's what drives us. Listeners, make sure you are listening to the music and look at the tour dates. And if they're anywhere close to you, I highly recommend you get out and see Louis Prima Jr. and the Witnesses. Louis, thank you for taking time out of your day and being on Before the Lights. I greatly appreciate talking to you and learning more about your journey. Oh, I thank you for having us. Uh, and, you know, if, if when we get the album out and you want to have me on again to chat some more, I got I got a big mouth. I know how to talk. <laughs> I think we'll do that. Definitely. We'll, we'll make a plan to do that. Listeners follow me on Instagram at before the lights podcast and follow me anywhere. Podcasts are found. Thank you for listening to before the lights. I'm Tommy Canale. And until next time, everybody, I salute a chin chin. <laughs>